Well, thanks. Um, I'm glad you could join us tonight. I'm expecting this to be rather lively, as this presidential cycle has been unusually entertaining, uh, for me at least. <laughs> the president's low approval rating in key swing states and among independents suggests that a good challenger can take enough states to win the election. And it's not as if next year will provide a rising economic wave to help out the incumbent. If anything, I think things will probably get worse. So if it looks like a credible alternative could be President Obama, do we have one? And if there's more than one, who should the advocates of liberty and limited government support? There's a good case to be made to play it safe. If this country can't take four more years of rapidly expanding government, it makes a lot of sense to try for a solid base hit instead of swinging for the fences with a more radical candidate. But it's not much fun to play it safe. Maybe the country is in such dire straits and our incumbent president is so unpopular that we should take a risk and try out the candidate of our hearts, if not our heads. So tonight we'll hear from staffers and former staffers from a few of the candidates hoping to take a shot at President Obama next year. We'll spend five to seven minutes explaining why I should support their candidate, and then we'll open up for, quest for questions. And at the end, we'll do our own vote to see who you guys support. And I'll mention now for the record that AF is a nonpartisan educational organization and this is not endorsing any candidate in any way whatsoever. Uh, so I'll start first, I guess we'll go left to right. Uh, Jonathan Bidlack. Uh, Jonathan's finance director for Governor Gary Johnson's 2012 presidential campaign and is the former director of fundraising for Ron Paul's 2008 presidential campaign. He's also the founder of the independent consulting firm Bidlack & Associates, LLC, with clients ranging from federal and state political candidates to advocacy organizations and other nonprofits. Jonathan began his career in the financial services industry as an investment analyst for one of the world's largest hedge fund managers. Originally from Massachusetts, he holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Princeton. Currently resides in Arlington, Virginia. Okay. Or sorry, Alexandria, Virginia. And furthermore, four years ago, when after the same round table, he was on the panel speaking for Ron Paul. <laughs> so, so welcome him back for you. I mean, later. maybe Huntsman 2016, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you can just get started and I'll introduce people as they go. Sure. Um, well, thank you for the invite. Um, I guess that's how we know CNN is sponsoring this debate, being that Gary Johnson's here. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I'm assuming everyone here is pretty familiar with Gunnar Johnson and with uh, the other candidates. Um, you know, I think, uh, for me, uh, you know, I obviously worked for Dr. Paul four years ago. I strongly support um, Dr. Paul this time around as well. Um, I, uh, to some degree, uh, take issue, I guess, with the premise of this in, in that um, I don't think that uh, the idea that you have to just support, I mean, you can only vote for one candidate. That doesn't mean you have to support one for one candidate. Um, to me, like my personal interest in politics is driven by ideas, um, and to the degree that there are multiple candidates who support those ideas and present those ideas in different ways, um, I think that those candidates deserve our support, um, even if they, you know, we may have disagreements on other issues. Um, so, you know, that's uh, so. I think there are like plenty of candidates here who um, who are going to say things that you're going to agree with, um, and rightfully so, and they deserve your support um, for that reason. Um, that said, I. Uh, you know, I, uh, I guess I don't um, specifically want to tell anyone who to support. It's the sort of, uh, I guess, a whole, uh, you know, Hayek uh, notion of localized knowledge, and maybe that you know best who to support based on um, uh, your own personal beliefs. Um, but I will make a couple of comments in terms of just the general field. Um, so the question I think that was sort of surrounding this forum is um, who should the youth support? Um, and my feeling is that um, you know people our age are generally speaking skewing fiscally conservative and socially liberal. Um, I mean, friends who I know who from college who were Democrats, when you say we need to balance the budget, um, they get that because the idea of you know spending what you take in um, is not really a very novel concept. You know, in your normal life, you understand that well. You know, I have an income of forty thousand dollars a year. I can't go spending like I have an income of a million dollars a year. Um, so I think there are reasons as to why that issue becomes um, one that is, you know, a little more politicized in, in D.C. Um, but on, a, on on this very you know nonpartisan level, um, I think most people are, are you know, they get the core of fiscal conservatism. Um, on the social side, I think that you have a little bit different scenario. Um, you have people who are obviously you know, uh, um, you know, have certain views on abortion or immigration or whatever issue you want. Um, but I would argue that over time, generally speaking, you know, people have skewed, or people particularly driven by the youth have tended to skew more, um, more socially liberal. Um, and so, anyway, I guess to, to make the pitch for Governor Johnson, I would say that I think that out of the candidates on the stage, um, 
despite the fact that you know all of them are going to have um, their a significant number of positives on a number of issues. Um, I think Governor Johnson most closely fits the beliefs that the majority of the youth have, um, which is that they're unshakably he's unshakably fiscally conservative um, and pretty socially tolerant. Um, and you can make the case, of course, from an electoral standpoint that that gives him better odds in the general election and all that sort of stuff. Um, I'm not really going to make any sort of electoral arguments, and I don't really think they're that relevant, to be honest, um, particularly in the primary, because um, ultimately the primary is, is about deciding on the direction of the Republican Party. Um, and so, you know, uh, it's very if you, if you want to, you know, compromise and say, well, we'll pick up a candidate who's not here. Newt Gingrich has the best chance of winning, so we should all get behind Newt Gingrich. Okay. Um, well, you know, I mean, so so I do fundraising for a living, and uh, you know, I often talk to donors who sort of make that case. You know, I, the, the conversation will go something like this: um, I don't see Governor Johnson in debates. Um, why should I give you money? I should give money to Mitt Romney, who is marginally better than than you know Barack Obama. Um, and the point that I always make to them, and, and, the, and the comment that I've made numerous times, and I'll just put it verbatim exactly as I say it, um, I say, you are the problem with America. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the reason why, there's a very concrete reason why I say that. I mean, you ask, why did John McCain get the nomination four years ago, right? Um, I think regardless of whether people voted for McCain, I think a lot of people recognize that McCain was a very flawed candidate. Um, and the argument was, well, he's more moderate, or he has these sort of qualities that will match up better with Obama, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he had no enthusiasm behind him. There were no ideas that he had that were that people, for people to be enthusiastic about. Um, and so when people start making these sort of strategic um, you know, uh, calculations, um, you end up with um, essentially the status quo. Um, and so you know, to David's point, I think that, uh, that you know, we are in you know, there's that Chinese proverb, you know, may you live in interesting times, and it's sort of a sarcastic kind of proverb. Um, and so I think we can all agree that we live in very interesting times right now. Um, and the question is, how are we going to respond to these interesting times? Um, and that's why the ideas matter so much. Um, and so, you know, I think when you're deciding who to support in the political realm, um, you know, maybe if you're a... Uh, Maybe if you're 65 and you want to say, well, I got to vote for the lesser of two evils, that's one thing. Um, but I think that when you're when you're younger, there is this sort of, you know, it's not just a matter of being true to the, the core beliefs that you have. Um, it's also a matter of that when you're casting your vote, you're not just determining the, you know, you're not you're not just backing a candidate. Um, you're really driving the direction of the discourse in this country. Um, and so, you know, from my personal view, I would argue that Governor Johnson probably has the best um, sort of sort of fit with where most young people and the country as a whole um, really need to be. Um, not to say that there are other candidates that are very close um, or have you know a claim a claim to that. Um, so anyway, I mean, you know, that's sort of my pitch, and that, that is my encouragement. I mean, at the end of the day, you decide that there's another candidate um, who you know matches your views better than Governor Johnson. Um, then you know you should by all means not support Governor Johnson. You should support that candidate. Um, but my my strongest conviction is that you should not support a candidate simply because of the fact that um, you know they are perceived as having a better chance to win. Um, because of course by that logic, uh, wouldn't everyone in this room have supported Barack Obama four years ago? So. Well, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, next to you, Jack Hunter. Uh, Jack writes the Politicker, uh, the Political Ticker blog for Ron Paul's presidential campaign. Additionally, he's a columnist for The Daily Caller, The American Conservative, and assisted Senator Rand Paul with his book, The Tea Party Goes to Washington. He was a regular guest on Fox Business, Freedom's Watch, with Judge Andrew DePolitano, talk radio host Michael Savage's nationally syndicated program, Savage Nation, and the regular guest host for Mike Church on Sirius XM Patriot 125. Hunter is a longtime radio personality for the WTMA Talk Radio in Charleston, South Carolina, where he used the moniker The Southern Avenger, and is a columnist for Charleston City Paper. Hunter now resides in Washington, D.C. Can everybody hear me on this thing? Is it loud enough? Uh, good to be with y'all here today. I'm going to be a little less libertarian than my friend Jonathan and explain to you exactly why you should vote for Ron Paul. I'm not telling you, you need to vote for Ron Paul, but you make a very good point. We're at a point in our politics, in American politics, where what used to be considered radical is actually practical. And that's of particular importance to young people. And what I mean by that is, 
everyone in this country is uncomfortable with the status quo. And when I mean the status quo, when I'm talking about this city, I'm talking about our debt, I'm talking about our spending, I'm talking about an unsustainable situation. Now, we have a host, a field of candidates who are saying, I'm conservative, I'm a conservative Republican, I'm for the Constitution. Well, I'm here to tell you that Ron Paul represents the conversation that the GOP has needed to have with itself for at least 30 years since Reagan. You know, in 1980, it was cool to be a conservative. And I'm a Reagan fan, greatest president of my life. But before that, before Ronald Reagan, to be a conservative was something special and unique. I'm talking about Barry Goldwater's era, and after that, after Barry Goldwater got his butt kicked in 64, it wasn't necessarily cool to be a conservative. What we had after 1980 with the Republican Party and the term conservative and this whole limited government philosophy is basically any Republican you talk to will now say they're a conservative Republican. Lindsey Graham in my home state of South Carolina describes himself as a conservative Republican. Now I bring that up because there's obviously a stretching of the definition there. Ron Paul is a constitutionalist. He is a conservative in the Barry Goldwater sense. He believes that we should only do our federal government what's in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. I believe he said in the last debate, you know, all of us on this stage here having these Republican debates, if we just did what we swore to do and uphold the Constitution, we wouldn't have 80% of the government we have, and there would be no arguments. We'd be united force in taking on the liberal Democrats who we can always expect awful things from. Well, let me ask you this. In this election, the Tea Party, the whole limited government movement, everybody agrees they want spending cuts and they want big spending cuts. This is of particular importance to young people who know they're not going to see this bankrupt entitlement system, who know we can't keep spending money in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and Iran and wherever else Lindsey Graham wants to go next week. We can't keep doing that. <laughs> it's of particular importance to notice, Ron, note that Ron Paul and his budget cuts $1 <coughs> trillion dollars in the first year. Everybody from Rush Limbaugh to Sean Hannity has said, you've got to give it to Ron Paul. He's going to cut $1 trillion in the first year, and that's the kind of cuts we need. I ask you this, why haven't any of the other candidates offered such cuts? Why is it Mitt Romney or Newt Gingrich or some of these other people, Rick Perry, standing up and saying, I'm offering those same, same kind of big, bold cuts? Because they can't do it. They are not serious. There is an equation when you look at cutting government spending. Obviously, we know we spend more on entitlements than anything else that we do. But second, right after that, to the tune of about $1.2 trillion a year, is our Pentagon spending. To the degree that the GOP does not want to look at that, and to pretend that actually being in Afghanistan for a decade at this point is still really about national defense. No, it's not. Not at all. To the degree that they will not re-examine one of the most expensive parts of what we spend money on here in Washington, D.C., they will never be able to cut spending. And people say, Jack, well, you're an extremist. Ron Paul's an extremist. How can you dare say that? Well, look at the evidence. Who else is offering $1 trillion in cuts? The social issues are important to some people. Other issues are important to some people. What's important to all Americans across the board, and this even goes for people who voted for Barack Obama. People are frightened to death of the avalanche that's coming in the future from this mountain of death and there's only one person running who could feasibly win and does well with independence, quite frankly. There's only two people in this race, Mitt Romney and, and Ron Paul, who do well with independence for completely opposite reasons, who has a shot at the White House and could actually do what Republicans have been talking about for the last 30 years. So that's my case for Ron Paul. Thanks. Next we have Jennifer Paul. Jen is Economic Policy Director for John Huntsman's presidential campaign. She's also Chief of Staff at E21, Economic Policies for the 21st Century, a new nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to economic research and innovative public policy solutions based on the principles of free enterprise, fiscal discipline, and individual freedom. Ms. Palm was previously the Appropriations and Budget Counsel for the Senate Republican Policy Committee, where she was responsible for briefing senators and staff on federal budgetary strategy and procedure and formulating policy proposals. In 2007, she served as Economic Policy Coordinator for Mayor Giuliani's presidential campaign in New York, formulating the tax and budgetary aspects of Giuliani's policy platform. Originally from Indiana, Ms. Paul received a JD and a BA in English from Indiana University. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I have to say, I, I, I hate to follow that very spirited speech of the, I think, Ron Paul centered crowd, but <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, I am the economic policy director for John Huntsman here in DC. Um, and 
That being said, my focus has primarily been on economic policies, but I'll do my best to give you the pitch on why I think John Huntsman's the best guy for the job. Um, I think John Huntsman, first of all, he's the only candidate in the race who uh, plays guitar, rides a motorcycle, and speaks Mandarin. <laughs> um, which, you know, I think says something about him. He's, uh, he's one of the most genuine candidates in the race. And uh, I want to talk to you mostly about how I think he has been perceived as very moderate. And I think he's really one of the most conservative candidates for the, up to the Republican primary. And I also think he should appeal very strongly to libertarians. Um, John Huntsman's record uh, hasn't really gotten a fair shake. Um, you know, he's, he's one of the sideline candidates in the debate, but uh, he's been extraordinarily consistent in his conservative record, both as um, governor of Utah from 2004 on and, uh, and all of his service for the different presidents that he's worked for in the White House. Um, his tax and economic plan is the only one that's been supported by the Wall Street Journal as being truly fiscally conservative. Uh, it's very, very strong. I know that um, Ron Paul has a $1 trillion spending cut plan, um, but Governor Huntsman's focused more, um, more primarily on restoring fiscal discipline through rational tax policy and spending cuts to follow. So um, he's simplifying the tax code. Uh, we are getting rid of all deductions and credits and restoring just three rates, 8%, 14%, and 23%. We're getting rid of the AMT, we're cutting the corporate tax rate, and we're bringing um, jobs back to America, which is what Huntsman is primarily focused on. Um, when he was governor of Utah, he was responsible for the largest tax cut in Utah history. He was also um, credited with um, number one in job creation while he was uh, across all of the states when he was governor of Utah. And he was named the best managed state by the Pew Foundation for whatever that's worth. Um, <laughs> he has been consistent throughout his career on gun rights, on immigration, on abortion, um, supporting the 10th Amendment, um, and you know all kinds of things that really appeal to libertarians and conservatives alike. Um, He's for fair trade, and he's primarily for job creation, which is, I think we all agree what our country needs right now. Um, in the wake of the ridiculous administration that we have right now, which I need not elaborate on, um, I think we need real policies for actually restoring um, small businesses, uh, our number one job creator in the country, and uh, tax policies that will actually bring jobs back to the country. So um, I can elaborate more on particular policies you know, in the q and I don't want to bore you with a litany, which I already probably have, but, oh, John has been Oh, yeah, you're going. Yeah, I'm sure you're back. Uh, and then finally, we have Derek Khanna. Uh, Derek worked for the Mitt Romney 2008 presidential campaign. Uh, the campaign is unable to send anybody uh, for tonight, so we got a former staffer. Uh, serving on the governor's Northeast finance team, well, later joining the field team in New Hampshire and South Carolina. After the campaign, Kano was appointed executive political director of the College Republicans for the Massachusetts <laughs> State GOP. After helping with the election of Senator Scott Brown, Derek joined his D.C. office, first as special assistant to the chief of staff, and currently in a legislative position working with the House Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, Armed Services Committee, and on technology issues. Um, Mr. Kano is also attending Georgetown Law in their evening program. Uh, he attended UMass Amherst, where he graduated summa cum laude with a BA in political science and Middle Eastern history. All right, great. Thank you. And uh, thanks to all of our previous speakers. I think you guys brought up a whole bunch of interesting points that we should think about and talk about in the Q&A. Uh, specifically, uh, I think your, your argument uh, was also in favor of an instant runoff voting system, which is something that we could probably talk about a little bit more. Uh, but it's probably an idea worth consideration. But I'm here to talk today about uh, Mitt Romney. I guess I got to clear, I guess it's not worthy of consideration. But, <laughs> uh, but I'm here to talk today about Mitt Romney, uh, obviously who I was able to work for in 2008. I'm from Massachusetts, he was my governor, and uh, I, I saw him in action. Uh, there, there is no governor in the United States who has vetoed as many bills uh, as Mitt Romney did. And in his last year in office, he vetoed 295. <laughs> He vetoed 295 budget provisions in the last year in office. And almost all of his, his vetoes were, were overridden. And that's what I wanted to talk to you today about, which was the number one knock against Romney, which of course is the individual mandate. A lot of times when we have this conversation, the individual mandate as far as the Massachusetts health care plan. 
a lot of times when we have this conversation, we take it out of the Massachusetts box and don't remember that Massachusetts, the state legislature is 10% Republican. Usually there aren't enough Republicans in Massachusetts to have a roll call vote. They have to all show up. And my point in saying this to you guys is, when you have 10% of, of, of the legislature that's Republican, you have to make really tactical decisions. And Massachusetts was clearly going down the route to universal health care. Everyone could see it. Teddy Kennedy was leading the charge. And today, we would have universal health care in Massachusetts, and it would have already bankrupted Massachusetts. Now, obviously, the situation is, is, is difficult in Massachusetts with the current health care program. But this was an alternative provided by Mitt Romney to use market solutions in order to address a problem that we all recognize that was very much preferable to the alternative. And nearly every veto that he did, including on relatively mundane issues, such as uh, birth control or funding for the state zoos, not only were reversed by the state legislature, they were reversed unanimously. 100% of the state legislature were voted to override his vetoes. So I, I wanted to provide a little bit of that perspective there when we have this conversation and the knock against the Massachusetts health care plan. Uh, which, of course, even at the time, he said each state should experiment on their own and figure out what works for them. Uh, and I think we're figuring out now what parts of the Massachusetts plan have worked and what parts clearly haven't worked. So that was just to address the number one criticism on Mitt Romney. And, of course, I'd love to hear your questions in the Q&A. Uh, but the major thing that leads me to support Mitt Romney is I think it's a historic anomaly that we've never chosen a real business leader uh, in a position of power for the presidency. That seems to me like a historic anomaly. Uh, because in some ways, uh, being in charge of a consulting firm like Bank Capital is the exact type of person that you want in the White House. Uh, when I was on the campaign with trail with him, he would often talk about bringing in the very best experts and looking at an issue and having his team be assigned in two different groups to represent different sides and putting them off against one another. That's a business mentality. We don't see that in the government today. You know, every year, your, your cell phone gets two times faster. Moore's Law, 18 months, actually. 18 months, it, gets, it doubles in speed. We don't see that today in the government. And there have been limited exercises in that direction as far as figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And that needs to be expanded. So for example, in 1993, uh, Senator Moyhan, uh, he helped uh, create a pilot program uh, for uh, unemployment compensation. He believed that unemployment compensation could be more effective if you help those people look for jobs. So they created a pilot program in five different states. They all tried it in different manners, and they were required to do a test population A and a test population B, one population with the old system, one population with the new system. And they figured out, wait a second, this actually saves us money. And that's why the current unemployment compensation system, with all of its faults, is one step better than it was before 1993. Well, today, the United States government still does a lot of these pilot programs across the United States. But most of this data is never analyzed. Most of this data is never provided in a transparent manner. And I'm sure that you may have some perspective on this, having worked in this arena. But this should be, this, this should be the status quo for every program. We should want states to experiment. We should want to come back to the table five years later and look at the data. We have 300 million citizens in the United States. This is a massive, control, uh, massive piece of data in order to learn what works bring in the best economists, and use a normal regression, and figure out what we can do better. And that's the type of mentality that Mitt Romney would provide from his experience as a business leader, as governor of Massachusetts, and already on the campaign. Well, that's great. Um, OK, so you've heard the opening pitch from everybody. Uh, I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. Um, I have a few of my own, but I'll, we'll let you ask the first one. Um, go ahead, Stephen. All right. Hey, Jennifer, being from Utah, I am obviously <coughs> interested in Governor Huntsman. And in the recent weeks, I think uh, Krauthammer's written something, Will's written something, Eric Erickson's written something, uh, James Petrolekas, or however you say it, uh, has written something. And they're all starting to say, let's give Huntsman the second chance. And they're, they're saying, wow, he's actually pretty conservative. Look at all this stuff. Why do you think that has changed? Is that a campaign strategy that has changed that? Or why is Huntsman, he was once perceived as running away from conservatism in the Republican Party, and now he's beginning to be perceived as a conservative who's you know, right at home in the Republican Party. Did you guys change something, or did 
Well, I think the only thing that's really changed is that he's gotten a, a deeper look. Um, he's been remarkably consistent since the beginning of the campaign with his record and his policies, and we've always been sort of the one percent candidate. I think we were like, in, I mean, we were in the same box as Rick Santorum for a while, and then we started on that guy. But um, and as the field has sort of whittled down, um, I think people have taken a deeper look at Huntsman and. People like George Will and Jim Panakoukas and Eric Erickson, like you've said, have really gotten into his record and recognized that he's been um, you know, consistently for uh, the Second Amendment, consistently um, had very strong economic policies. Um, like I said, he's had the largest tax cut in Utah history uh, as governor. And I think it's really just been time that people have finally started to take a look and realize that he's you know, really a lot more conservative than the media painted him as initially. It's not, a, it's not a new strategy, we just keep saying the same thing. <laughs> so this is for Mr. Jack Hunter. Um, I'm a Ron Paul supporter, but the most, the biggest problem that I hear people having with voting for Dr. Paul is his foreign policy. They love him domestically, but he scares the hell out of them foreign policy-wise. And I never really thought much of it until I started going to these foreign policy institutes and I hear my neocon pals in my ear and it scares me. And what would you say to someone who is threatened by his foreign I policy? I think the dividing line on the right, I don't know why I keep pulling this microphone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course I have it. The dividing line on the right is foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, I sort of meant what I meant earlier when I said, uh, emphasize you're never going to be able to cut spending unless you look at foreign policy. It's such a large piece of the pie. As far as the actual security aspect, which is what really concerns people, is Sharia is going to happen in Fargo, North Dakota overnight, and we're not in Syria tomorrow, that kind of stuff. And I don't mean to be flippant, but it, I mean, when you connect the dots, a lot of people have that attitude. Um, a lot of Republicans look at foreign policy in the, much way, the, the same way that liberal Democrats look at the domestic welfare state. Oh, if we get rid of this program or we don't have a Department of Education, well, the world's going to collapse. We just have to have this sort of stuff. And conservatives rightly say, no, the federal government shouldn't be doing that. We're doing too much. There's different ways of doing it. We're not hurting students. We're not hurting poor people. Republicans are going to have to learn to look at foreign policy that way. It is inherently conservative to apply a cost-benefit analysis to anything. So, the money we've spent, the lives we've sacrificed in Iraq and Afghanistan, and God knows what else we're going to get involved in, was it worth it then? Will it be worth it in the future? Is it worth putting our children and grandchildren into bankruptcy for it? Very few Republicans will come out and just talk about this and sort of examine it. Ron's one of the few, and to the degree that the GOP has moved in his direction, and it has. Very, I don't know how quickly, but a lot more than it was in 2008, is the reason his poll numbers are where they are, is that the GOP is starting to have that conversation. When his son, Senator Rand Paul, or Tom Coburn, talks about Pentagon spending, and all these conservative Republicans start to talk more like Ron Paul, and Paul himself points out that his foreign policy isn't that much different than what people voted for in 2000 with George W. Bush pre-9-11 that we can't nation build, that we can't do all this stuff, we're a humble nation that will respect us. So Republicans have already voted for this. We've been there before. Of course, 9-11 did change everything. In some ways, we had to react going to Afghanistan, but we also overreacted by doing all of this other sort of crazy stuff that has taken us to the point we're at. That's what I say to our Republican friends who have a problem with wrong on foreign policy, but I guess more people need to be saying it. Yeah, you got a policy record of the Huntsman campaign, so that's I'm kind of hit, hit directly at that. Okay. Paul campaign wants to cut a trillion dollars in the first year, I guess that's FY13. Huntsman campaign, a trillion dollars, or if not, how much? Um, we haven't put a figure on it, I'll be honest. Uh, I think a trillion dollars, having been on the budget committee and having worked in the federal government and the Senate for quite a while, I think a trillion dollars is kind of ludicrous. Um, that's my personal opinion, that is not the stance of the governor. <laughs> um, it, we're more concerned about tax policy right now. Um, uh, we're deeply concerned about the deficit and the debt, but I think that um, we're more concerned about jobs and you know freezing the spending where it is right now. And once we get the tax situation in order, once we get the job situation in order, addressing spending then. Um, uh, I think uh, Governor Huntsman's uh, health care, you know, before repealing Obamacare, we definitely need to address the entitlements. Um, I don't think there's any, a rational person in this room who would disagree with any of that. Um, Social Security needs to be saved rationally, um, but we're you know we're going to address that at a later date. Put a specific number on a later date. Well, Huntsman supports the Ryan plan, doesn't he? He does. 
So there's a dog <laughs> bigger than that, presumably. Um, he, we've adopted part of the Ryan plan. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Uh, Dan? 75 years out, absolutely, yes, there's a dollar figure on that. Um, I guess my question for everybody is that um, out of what your candidates have stated so far, what is the single largest spending cut uh, proposal that you have? And then hopefully, what, how many years it would actually take to achieve that savings? So, um, yeah, I'll answer that first. Um, just to kind of refute one of the things that Jack said earlier. Um, I mean, Governor Johnson is the candidate who's on the record as promising the largest spending cuts. Um, you know, I believe his comment has been that he doesn't make many promises, um, but that he does promise that he will, um, he will submit a balanced budget to Congress. Um, and that he will veto any, um, any proposed expenditures that exceed revenues. Um, that's something that the Paul plan actually doesn't do. Um, I think it's kind of interesting that um, <coughs> you know, Dr. Paul um, um, you know, has, has never voted for an unbalanced budget during his time in Congress, which is obviously incredibly impressive. Um, but in the economic proposal that was put forward, um, cutting a trillion dollars doesn't actually balance the budget. So if you kind of extend the logic, what that means is that President Paul would actually uh, submit an, un an unbalanced budget and approve an unbalanced budget, um, which Governor Johnson would not do. Um, and all the other candidates in the race, I believe, I and mean, well, again, Paul is coming close, um, you know, much closer than the other candidates in the race, um, Governor Johnson is the only one who, who has actually you know, made the point that we are at a, um, a financial precipice and we need to be, um, you know, we need to address that issue head on, and um, you know I think um, we can haggle over um, you know whether whether a trillion dollars in spending cuts is significant or insignificant. Um, but I would just make the point that you know to call that ludicrous is actually a little surprising because um, this idea that we can year after year continue to spend more money than we're taking in um, to me that actually seems to be the pretty ludicrous idea from a fiscally conservative perspective. Now I get the joy of being a moderator a little bit. Was that a question for everybody? Um, John is absolutely right. Gary Johnson's plan is probably slightly more radical than Ron Paul's. Um, I said earlier that this is about the conversation we're having in the GOP moving in the direction of what constitutional conservative libertarianism, however you want to look at it, a genuine limited government direction. To answer your question, a trillion dollars would balance the budget in three years. That's his plan. It's based on his son, Senator Rand Paul's plan, which would have balanced the budget in five years. And if you remember, there were only seven co-signers for that in the United States Senate. DeMint and McConnell and Orrin Hatch, who were worried about elections in their home state, I'm sure, side on to that. The point being, a majority of the Republican Party obviously thought that Rand Paul's plan was too radical and did not approve of the Senate. Ron Paul's plan running in this election, he is a front runner. You're looking at Gingrich, Romney, and Ron Paul are top three tier is still considered radical. What did Newt Gingrich say? Oh, well, that's a non-starter, the one trillion dollar cut. Well, what does the Tea Party want? They want one trillion dollars in cuts. So Jonathan's absolutely right that maybe Gary Johnson's plan is slightly more radical, but I'm telling you we can balance in the, three, the budget in three years with one trillion in cuts, and there's enough of Republican support for that, at least in the grassroots, to give this guy 22% in Iowa right now, 21% or whatever it is. That is changing things in a seriously limited government direction. I'm glad to be on board. No apologies. Your question was specific cuts, wasn't it? Specific provisions, yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Budgets are great, but provisions are more important. Right. Um, well, you know, I'll freely admit that um, we have not laid out a, a, an item-by-item -item spending cut plan. I will say the most significant things that Governor Huntsman supports devolving are going to lead to significant cost savings including privatizing uh, Fannie and Freddie, um, which is you know, going to be very significant in the long run, not only stabilizing the housing market, but getting rid of the huge GSE boondoggle that we have on our books. Um, he also supports the Ryan plan for uh, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, which will lead to significant entitlement savings down the road. Um, as far as domestic spending cuts, uh, sorry, discretionary spending cuts, um, we haven't done an item by item list for that, like I said. Um, and just to address you guys, uh, I personally think that cutting a trillion dollars in one year of the budget, I use ludicrous sort of loosely, but I don't think it's practical. <laughs> it may be an excellent aspirational dream, but I don't, I, you know, in speaking in the real world, Strange. I don't know that it's, you know, <laughs> actually practically going to happen. So um, Governor Huntsman has put forward, I, I guess, 
some more um, maybe practical uh, ideas. Obviously, Ron is in the same boat. We haven't looked at our specific proposals, but it supports the balanced budget amendment, supports the Paul Ryan plan, supports the cap. Uh, and but I, I I do think that the idea of one trillion is not ludicrous. I think that the idea of saying that being able to balance the budget is ludicrous is kind of disturbing. Um, I, I especially if we're we're all here saying we support the balanced budget amendment, but then. In the end, we won't support cutting a trillion dollars. It seems to be a little bit disingenuous. I just far love as to see people list a trillion dollars that well, you so guys can I actually can I take a stab at that? Because I, I do want to like I do want to just take two seconds to <coughs> respond to the good specifics. Um, so Governor Johnson, the sim simplest points, the biggest parts of the budget: Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and, and military spending. Right. So Medicare and Medicaid, the idea is to cap take the amount to take the, the amount of funds that are currently being spent at the federal government level, cut them by 43 percent, and turn over the delivery to the states. Um, with the argument that the states will be able to, through comp uh, through competition, deliver those goods and services more efficiently than the federal government currently is. Um, as far as Social Security is concerned, there are plenty of reforms that are very tangible that can get to new Social Security spending, um, means testing, and, and you know, um, changing the escalator built in uh, Social Security to be based on the, um, the uh, wage index rather than the price index. Um, that can easily solve the problem there. Um, and then as far as military spending is concerned, the Cato, the Cato Institute has put forward estimates showing very clearly that you can reduce military spending by 40%. Um, obviously, this, this involves you know, leading Afghanistan, leading Iraq so much sooner rather than later, which I believe Governor Huntsman is in favor of. Um, and there are significant, you know, you can't tell if there isn't massive um, uh, inefficiencies within DOD and, and, you know, and the Pentagon. So, um, so those, are the, those are the specifics. Um, I think it can be done. I think the numbers are there. Um, so, I mean, the question is, what are the, what's the, what are the specifics that, that, what doesn't add up? My, my question for Derek, um, why, being that we know that Obama back in 2008 made all sorts of promises, I'm going to do, get rid of the Patriot Act, I'm going to close from the top of Bay, I'm going to balance the budget, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, why should an independent voter Trust Obama with, I mean, trust Mitt Romney, excuse me, but the number of flip flopping on the issues that you that, that he's had. Why do you believe that you're gonna that your candidate's gonna go in and balance the budget and do the things that he says he's gonna do? That's a great question. Uh, so let's talk about some of the flip flops. That's the other other side of the coin that I didn't address, obviously. Uh, so on the issue of abortion, which is probably the most uh, well covered one, um, like Ronald Reagan, he, he he changed his mind on that issue. Um, he, he's been consistent since I think 2003. Um, if you if you want a purist purist on abortion, you don't want somebody who ever uh, changed their mind. Then I guess you would never go to Ronald Reagan. Uh, addressing some of the other issues, uh, as far as the the health care plan, I, I explained that disparity a little bit. Uh, but obviously, Newt Gingrich, who in 2007 advocated for an individual mandate uh, on his website, uh, the exact plan that we actually have now. Uh, not some of the kind of wishy-washy statements we've gotten in the past year and a half. Um, you know, that was 2007. Uh, that was not the plan that was being advocated by Romney, uh, and uh, I think that's quite recent. Uh, if, if, as far as other issues, I can, of course, address those. Uh, but when he was governor of Massachusetts, he proposed a balanced budget every single year. Uh, you know, we didn't have this, this record with Obama. Uh, we do have a record with Mitt Romney. We, we know that he can balance the budget even when times are hard. Uh, you know, he, he had to fight to balance the budget every year with the Democrats. Uh, there are a lot of difficulties there. Obviously, they said before, 295 vetoes in his last year in office just in the budget. Uh, Jennifer, you emphasize that, you know, uh, Governor Hanson doesn't agree with all of the parts of the, um, uh, the Medicare plan, uh, Paul Ryan's Medicare plan, excuse me. Uh, can you can you expand on that? What parts does he have trouble uh, with, and, and why? Oh, I think I may I may have misspoke, or maybe uh, it got caught in crosshairs. Sure. Uh, Paul Ryan put forward a, a total budget plan, not only for Medicare and Medicaid, but for right. defense spending and and um, and all the rest. Uh, we have adopted the Ryan plan for Medicare and Medicaid, so he doesn't disagree with me. Well, 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 as far as the budget plan <laughs> as a whole, what parts of it does does he have a problem? Um, We actually, what I meant was, we differ in our tax plans. So he, it was a total plan for revenue. Sorry, I'm talking about the process. Um, 
uh, he put forward not only a plan for budget but also for revenues and for entitlement spending. And we adopted a we adopted the Wolfson Simpson plan for our revenue plan with slightly different numbers, and uh, we used a different corporate rate. And, um, we didn't include any of the deductions and credits that Wolfson Simpson included. Uh, so we actually achieved more savings in our revenue plan. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, there is one candidate who's not on the panel tonight, and that is Newt Gingrich, who is the nominal front runner. Uh, so my question for each of the panelists is, uh, what argument would you make to conservatives and libertarians that your candidate is a better choice than Gingrich, and also, how is your candidate a better position to beat Obama next year? Right. Sure, I mean, I, I definitely talk about Newt Gingrich. I already mentioned the individual mandate in 2007. Uh, I, I think of all the candidates, he has the highest negative ratings. He's somewhere around 45% negative rating with the American people. Uh, that's, that's pretty bad. Uh, and uh, not just that, but some of his biggest opponents are within the Republican Party. Uh, and if you look back to the political science perspective, winning with 45% negative ratings, that's hard. Mm -hmm. uh, so just in a general election perspective, it, it's, it's not so good. But as far as uh, a, a general election going forward, I mean, you're, you're dealing with a lot of baggage there. Uh, the other candidate I can think of with such a negative rating would be Hillary Clinton. But a lot of people didn't really know her as a candidate. There's a lot of baggage they associate with Bill Clinton. They didn't like some of the things that she, she had said, her demeanor, her demeanor, these type of things. Newt Gingrich's baggage is being voted uh, to be fined 300 grand by 300 House members. Uh, I have the numbers here. 300 House members, and uh, I forgot how many of them were Republicans, but it was well oh, 196 Republicans in the House. It was passed 395 to 28. He had 26 congressmen who supported him. And my point is that stuff's going to come forward. All that baggage is going to come forward. How he's earned $150 million since she's left office, that's going to come forward. And the most ethical part of that was earning $1.5 million from Freddie Mac, which is basically taxpayer money. He basically earned $1.5 million from all of you. And that's the most ethical part of that money. Uh, so I think there's a lot of baggage to go around as far as Newt Gingrich. I don't know where he stands on a lot of these issues. As far as Libya, he changed his mind within the same day. You have a quote of him saying he supports it, a quote saying that he's against it. Uh, and, and, and that wasn't after circumstances had changed or a significant period of time. Uh, and, and you obviously have the Paul Ryan quote, which I won't even address. I'll just let you guys watch it on YouTube. Uh, well, I won't reiterate all of that. I think we all know about Newt's baggage. And there's an argument to be made that the candidate, Gingrich, um, the support, everybody knows about his baggage already. It's sort of baked in to his support unless he you know, comes up with some new nonsense, which I don't think is beyond belief. But um, you know, I think the biggest difference between John Huntsman and Newt Gingrich is that John Huntsman's got real executive experience. Um, he was actually governor of a state. Um, you, you know, I think that we're looking for a real leader, and being Speaker of the House is definitely Leadership, but being the chief executive of the state is different. Um, John Huntsman's got real corporate world experience as well, and the biggest difference is that he's got he's the the only candidate in the race who has real foreign policy leadership experience. Being ambassador to China, he really understands um, the the trade difficulties and the and the foreign policy difficulties that we face going forward. And I think that's going to make a big difference in the next four years. Everything they said. Plus, plus. I, I will designate this the funnest part of the panel since Newt Gingrich isn't here and he's just so god awful in so many ways. <laughs> Newt Gingrich is a political schizophrenic. People are wondering, I'm dead serious when I say that. People are wondering where all these liberal ideas over the years, the support for the individual health care mandate, support for gun control, he hasn't made up his mind on abortion in some, some instances, so on and on and on. Uh, it comes from not having a regular, formal set of principles. Uh, Business Insider's Michael Brendan Doherty actually put it best. He said, do you know why Newt Gingrich has so many ideas? He's not a dummy, but why does he have so many ideas? Because there's no filter on his untrained roaming intellect. And that's exactly right. Newt Gingrich scares, scares the hell out of me. I would never want to see him be President of the United States. My biggest problem as a conservative, forget about his temperament, his liberal record with Newt Gingrich, is every time it's come down, you know, when the rubber meets the road, we're going to do something conservative in the way of really cutting government, he is always scared. He always chickens out. If you look back at 94 and the Republican Revolution, 
when you had this big you know, upswell in the grassroots of this country, bipartisan, let's cut government, let's do something. All of that Republican class, those freshmen in 94, if you ask them, where did the contract with America fail? They say, well, the leadership didn't really follow through. Newt Gingrich was the leadership. One of those guys was my former governor, Mark Sanford, in South Carolina, who before his career went south, quite literally, uh, <laughs> pretty good limited government and service. And he would make the point that the reason we didn't get things done is people like Newt Gingrich would not man up and do it. The Paul Ryan example is another good one. Uh, here's this really good idea for entitlement reform. Most conservatives were on board. What did he call it? Right-wing social engineering. Ron Paul offers a trigger and cuts everybody from Sean Hannity to Rush Limbaugh to the Tea Party thinks this is a great idea. What does Gingrich say? It's a non-starter. So I don't know what sort of, sort of conservative work you would get out of a president Newt Gingrich. In fact, given his sort of uh, the way he has that sort of micromanagerial technocratic mind that this president has, Barack Obama, I dare say you have a GOP version of Barack Obama. That's not good enough. Mm -hmm. so. um, I guess I have to say everything that they say. Uh, um, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think they, they, you guys kind of sucked all the, all the hair out of that question. The other, the other point I'll make is that um, you know, we, uh, we live in radical times, and so we, uh, I would argue we need pretty radical solutions. Um, and so set aside Newt Gingrich's baggage, set aside the fact that you don't know where he's going to come down. Um, the question is really, it, you know, do you have any evidence that he's going, he, he, he has the, um, the willingness and the actual core belief system um, to present the solutions that are necessary to solve the problems that we're facing? Um, and so, you know, in other words, is there even a chance that he will flop in the right direction? Um, and I would argue no, because there's, there's nothing that he has presented um, that is really a unique idea. Um, and so for all of the, I mean, unless you want to start talking about, you know, local immigration approval boards or whatever he's been proposing lately. But anyway, the point is that um, when it comes to facing the economic issues, which I think 99% of Americans are going to agree are the major, is the major problem that we're facing, um, what is Newt Gingrich offering that's different than Barack Obama? Um, what is he What is he offering that's different than the status quo? Um, and the answer is not much. In 2000, we in America elected a Republican president and a Republican Congress. Uh, the election we're held today, likely through next year, we probably have a Republican House and a Republican Senate. If your guy was a Republican president, how do we make sure that we don't relive the decidedly unlibertarian agenda of the unified government of the Bush administration? <laughs> Before Barack Obama came along, and all the conservatives didn't like that guy, and rightfully so, the biggest big government president in the history of the United States was George W. Bush. For every talk radio guy that now says, I didn't agree with everything Bush said, yes, you did. <laughs> every bit of it. And for as much time as I hear people complain about Barack Obama's little lapel pin or where Michelle went on vacation, I didn't hear half as much about Medicare Plan D and No Child Left Behind and all that. It's a big bunch of hypocrisy, as you just pointed out. Now, you know, Ronald Reagan had a good point about the three-legged stool in the GOP. You have your national security conservatives, you have your social conservatives, and you have your economic slash libertarian conservatives. I dare say the reason George W. Bush and his Republican Party was a complete disaster, let's not qualify that, it was terrible. There was no, that third stool that was the economic and libertarian wing was non-existent. I laugh when I hear guys like Mike Huckabee, who there's probably a few good things about Mike Huckabee, who doesn't go to CPAC one year because there's too many libertarians there. Well, guess what? That's why you have a big debt, a big budget problem now, because that was non-existent during the George W. Bush administration. The Republican Party needs that libertarian influence so they don't spend too much damn money. It has to be there. That's what Goldwater talked about, that's what Reagan talked about, and that's what's been non-existent in the Republican Party for so long, and why I'm working for the Ron Paul campaign. I guarantee you, if Ron Paul was president, we have a trickle-down politics in either party. Obama's Democratic Party listens to Obama. George W. Bush's Republican Party listen to George W. Bush. A Ron Paul Republican Party would give you better dividends, I promise that. <laughs> Anybody else want to feel that? Yeah, I'll just add. I mean, you know, that's why convictions matter, right? When you when you look at it in partisan terms, and you say you have a Republican president and a Republican Congress, that only really becomes an issue when you have the two of them working in concert, you know, to um, to to not when they're when they're being driven by partisanship and not by um, ideas. And so when you have a president who has actual convictions on on the various issues. Um, well, you know, then when you have big government conservatives in Congress, 
um, that suddenly matters a lot less because you have someone who's who's going to serve as a check regardless of whether they're you know you have a Republican controlled or Democratic controlled Congress. Um, in the case of Governor Johnson, you know he likes to point out that, that you know New Mexico is two to one Democrat, um, and you know he had whatever it was 750 vetoes um, outright and thousands of line of vetoes. Um, but he always points out that that you know a third of the bills that he vetoed um, were Republican bills. Um, because Republicans pretty much like to grow government just as much as the Democrats did. Um, they just, of course, did it in a little bit better way, and, you know, whatever the logic is. Um, but so, so, point being that um, when you select a candidate who has the conviction and will stand on ideas, um, that problem, you know, does, that, that problem no longer exists. And unfortunately, the Republicans for too long have been selecting candidate after candidate that, um, you know, gets in power and, um, as a result, just ends up, uh, um, you know, letting let, essentially letting the power get the best of them, and not not holding you know holding true to their beliefs. And so, you know, that's where looking at records of candidates really matters. And in the case of Governor Johnson, I'll just argue that, um, you know, I think it's very clear that he um, that not only did he did he you know talk the the limited government talk, um, but for eight years in a very hostile democratic state, he walked the small government walk. Um, and so. That's a, you know, I think that that's just a very important thing to look at when you're when you're comparing and contrasting candidates. I'm not going to say anything wholly different than that, except to highlight that uh, you know, I, I completely agree. It, it, you've got party in power is in charge of the presidency, the Senate, and the House. Obviously, matters. Leadership matters. Uh, policies matter. Direction matters. And you know, John Huntsman um, is for smaller government and. Um, you know, he's for uh, limiting Medicaid, he's for limiting the entitlement programs, he's for uh, privatizing Fannie Freddie. I've said all this already, I don't want to bore you guys again. But, you know, you hope that the leader of the party in, in the presidency um, will actually be somebody that the party wants to follow and has convictions and, um, and, and strong direction, and these guys sort of already said it, so. Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite quotes from the Bush administration was when they used to say that deficits don't matter. Learned that they do matter, and one of my favorite anecdotes was uh, when they were trying to re when they reauthorized the farm bill in the last year of the Bush administration. And a lot of conservatives actually thought that that would be a real opportunity to actually do something and not uh, continue that horrible program. Uh, they were they were at the signing ceremony, and some of the guys there said, "You know, let's get this horrible thing out the door. I want to be done with it." And Bush looked up and said, "Well, what do you mean?" And they said, oh, this thing's horrible. And he said, well, well, why am I signing it? They said, well, you always sign it. <laughs> 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 but my point in telling the story is that we, we, we need somebody who actually is intelligent in the White House. We need somebody who actually understands some of these issues and is able to look at them critically, bring in the real experts in the field and figure out, well, wait a second, this, this farm bill doesn't make any sense. Our ethanol policy doesn't make any sense. We have a quota, a subsidization, and uh, what is it, the third pillar to our, our strategy for for anarchy, it, it doesn't make any sense. I have one or two last questions. Uh, I have a question for Ted and John. Um, it's kind of a process question, I guess. Why your campaign is so shoddy? Because, you know, the, I mean, Huntsman, when he first started running, the, the joke was that he, was, <coughs> he lifted off a number of policy positions, and the joke was that he was going to primary Obama from the left. And you know, and you know, now with George Will and this kind of stuff that we talked about earlier, people are taking another look at him, and you know, and I'm taking another look at him. And says, well, that's not that bad. So what, I don't know. It, it seems like if you, how you position yourself, how you brand yourself, is very important. There was some sort of flaw in, in how that came about. And, and for John, for libertarians who don't want to uh, support a you know cranky neo confederate isolationist, Gary Johnson. <laughs> But yet the leading candidates, the, the leading issue for Gary Johnson seems to have been portrayed as you know legalizing marijuana, which I'm you know all in favor of. But you know, that shouldn't be the center point of your campaign. Now I say this obviously to be provocative to for you to you know talk about the, the process of your campaigns. But I think that's important because these are two candidates that would otherwise be attractive that seem to have uh, shot themselves in the foot. Um, I can't comment on a communication strategy only because Policy Shop is the only shop that's been in D.C. long term and I was not asked to consult on our communication policy um, early on. Uh, however, I do think that um, the GOP primary has been, um, I think, differently than in other years. 
highlighted by sort of flash in the pan, wonder children of the week uh, candidates. We we had Bachman, we had Perry. Um, you guys have followed it as well as I have. And um, you're right, uh, our policies haven't changed, but we've gotten a second look finally, and I can't really explain why. Um, Pardon? Huntsman Daughters. Yeah, the daughters, yeah. Just a question, though. Yeah. So obviously Huntsman doesn't have, didn't have very much money, but yet he spent his first ad buy to, uh, to show a panoramic of him uh, on his motorcycle going through the mountains mm -hmm. for about a minute. For an hour. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was quite a lot. Do you have any perspective on that? No. <laughs> Mitch Daniels must have been advising you. I am from Indiana. I was a Mitch fan, too. Um, yeah, all I can say is I'm glad that we're getting a second look, and I'm, our policies haven't changed, so I'm glad they're finally being taken seriously and viewed in a conservative light. John? Um, yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll address all that. Um, I mean, you know, first of all, uh, I mean, consider that there are many candidates in the, race, in the race this time around who have run before or have had significant political experience on the national stage. So, I mean, look at the, you know, we think of, we would agree that, you know, Dr. Paul is getting a greater amount of support this time than he did four years ago. Um, to a large degree, that's because he's been effectively in the public eye for the last four years. Um, the same is true with Romney, right? I mean, Romney's been essentially campaigning for president for the close of the last decade. Um, so, I mean, some would argue longer. Uh, so anyway, so, the, so, so that's a, a big factor, first of all, right? Governor Johnson personally was much more green, much less experienced. Um, you know, I think that's that much is obvious, um, and so um, you know, it's a it's a different ballgame. I mean, I personally didn't even know New Mexico was a state until I started working on the campaign. So I mean, you know, but, but realistically, right? I mean, I mean, it's it's not like he was governor of California, right? It's not like he's you know constantly been on Fox News. Um, so his starting point was very different than other candidates in the race. Um, the same is true from a fundraising perspective, right? I mean, Governor Johnson doesn't come to the table with you know 30 years of congressional experience building up a direct mail list. Um, you know, he's not, he, he again, hasn't been in politics for, you know, for a long period of time, and so as a result, um, you know, you're just, you know, I mean, it, as much as the, as the Ron Paul 2008 campaign was a grassroots campaign, having worked on this campaign now, after that campaign, I will tell you, this is really a grassroots <laughs> campaign, because it's just starting with nothing, right? I mean, I mean, Dr. Paul, you know, had, he ran for, he ran for president in 88, so he had name ID amongst libertarians. Um, again, the fact that, you know, just in, in Congress and so on. So even though the broader American populace might have not known who Dr. Paul was, um, he wasn't starting for nothing. Um, and so, you know, whereas Governor Johnson, by a large part, was. Um, so, you know, that's a big factor. So I just think, I, I think, I mean, realistically speaking, right, I mean, um, set aside all of the other issues that occurred that were, you know, to a significant degree beyond the campaign's control, like being excluded from CNN debates. You know, I, I'll actually, uh, I don't normally share this story on the record, but now I don't really care, so I think I will. Um, you know, so uh, you all know what happened with Governor Johnson in the CNN debate, um, and you know we had a, a private supporter who, independently, without us knowing, took out a, an ad in the New Hampshire uh, Union Leader and uh, the Manchester Union Leader, and um, you know as a result of that ad, um, CNN contacted our campaign office. And uh, I was here in D.C. with Governor Johnson, and uh, um, you know the, the bureau chief of CNN's Washington, D.C. office, who is the person responsible for determining um, which candidates get in debates, um, you know, calls Governor Johnson, and they have this 20-minute phone conversation, and it gets pretty heated. And at one point, you know, Governor Johnson says something to the effect of, um, you know, I can tell that what I'm saying is not going to change your mind, but I'm just going to tell you that I've been in two elections in my entire life, running for governor and running for re-election to governor, and I won both of them, and now you're excluding me from your debate. Well, after Governor Johnson got on the phone and we were talking about his conversation, the response that was given to him was, and I, and I, this is, again, secondhand from Governor Johnson, but the, the response was, um, I'll be honest, I didn't know that. To be honest, I don't know anything about it. So, so when you when you ask the question, why has Gary Johnson failed to catch on? I think there are a lot of organizational reasons. There are a lot of reasons specific to Gary Johnson, but there's also a lot of bullshit. Um, and uh, that, to me, you know, really hammers home. Um, you know, when you're not starting off with a significant war chest, um, you know, when you're not starting off with a significant amount of name recognition, um, you know, the media is not going to do you any favors. Um, and so. 
you know, in a lot of ways, that deck is stacked against you, and that's a very, you know, that's a, that's a difficult thing. And you know, would Governor Johnson have been, you know, ended up being the Republican nominee if he had been in all the debates? I don't know. Probably not. Uh, you know, I mean, as realistic as anyone. Um, but you know, to not be afforded that opportunity, I think, says a lot for the American political system. Um, and uh, you know, who knows? I mean, if he decides to, you know, stick with it, and, and uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just we'll just see how things pan out. But um, you know, it, it really does seem like uh, in the modern, you know, the modern age, you really have to be running for president multiple times. You know, you have to run once to get your name ID up, so that you can run again to have an actual chance. And Dr. Paul's a perfect example of that thing. On the Republican side. Well, sure. You know, I mean, I mean, even look at Barack Obama, right? I mean, Barack Obama didn't run twice, but you could argue that you know his his high-profile speech in '04 at the Democratic National Convention was effectively, you know, uh, if that speech doesn't happen, he doesn't he doesn't win in 2008. I think everyone knows that.